In the past year and a half, a term has become popular amongst a few YouTube creators. This term is frame flex. It's used to describe a condition predominantly affecting large fifth wheels over 17,000 pounds, and mainly toy hauler floor plans. Now, it's not to say that there may not be other types of floor plans and lower weight units that are being impacted as well. Frame flex generally is used to describe a flex or movement of the upper deck in the pin box section of the fifth wheel frame, flexing beyond a perceived design specification and causing frame or structural interior damage. The first indication of this damage is typically noticed in the room above the upper deck. Generally, cabinetry and trim start to show gaps that either grow or change in size depending on being hitched to a truck or not. I received quite a few comments and correspondence from viewers who want me to dig in deep to this issue to see if I can find real answers. A few weeks ago, I decided to dive deeper into the topic and determine where the answers lie. My search for answers landed me directly at the doorstep of the largest RV frame manufacturer in North America, if not the world, Lippert. They operate out of over 140 manufacturers distribution facilities in North America, Africa, and Europe. They supply highly engineered components for the RV, automotive, watercraft, and prefab hub industry, and they currently employ over 12,500 employees. They own several brands in multiple industries, brands you may be familiar with, such as Kurt, TaylorMade, Lumar, Ranch Hand, Furion, Aqua Training Bags, Ares, Happy Jack, Polyplastic, Retrax, Solera, SureShade, UWS, and more. Now that you know who Lippert is, let's talk about their part in this whole issue. First, Lippert builds RV frames, a lot of them, to the tune of about a thousand per day. Most, if not all, RVs that people say are experiencing frame flex probably sit on a Lippert frame simply because of the number of frames that they produce. A few weeks back, I made a video about this topic, but people wanted more answers, and they wanted to understand a little bit more about frame, frame construction, and what role the manufacturer of the frame actually plays in the overall construction of an RV. Today, we're gonna ask the manufacturer of these frames the hard questions that need to be asked to help us understand what's really going on and to learn a little bit more about the core structure that the vast majority of the RV industry builds their floor plans on. What's going on guys? So today is going to be a very interesting and very informative day for a lot of folks. Today I am here at Lippert's corporate headquarters, their marketing department, and we are going to have them answer the frame related questions that you all submitted to me and wanted answered. Now the folks at Lippert do know that I'm coming because they had to get the right people together. All right, so I have been in correspondence with the folks over at Lippert and they have prepared this interview specifically to address some of the problems that you all wanted to know the answer to. And I have a whole list of questions that you all submitted to me that you wanted me to ask them. So we're going to kick this video off and we're going to try to get to the bottom of why some of the things that you're concerned about are happening. So first of all, good afternoon. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you for having me come down to or come up to beautiful Elkhart, Indiana to have an important conversation with you all about a, a topic that definitely is uh, is one that people are wanting to know some answers to and they're wanting to understand a little bit better. And I believe that when we're done with this video, there will be some clarity. There will be some some insight for folks who are looking to spend time out with their families RVing and just wondering a little bit more about part of that structure, part of that experience that they're inherently going to be in whenever they buy their first RV or get in their second RV or the RV that they currently have. Now in front of me I have two guests from Lippert. If you could, could you quickly introduce yourself, how long you've been with the company and your role? Sure. My name is April Klein and I'm Vice President of Customer Support Services. And I'm Tim Schultz. I'm VP of OE Engineering. Okay. So if you could take a quick second and just kind of define what those roles are, what you actually do within the organization. Sure. I lead our service efforts and, you know, my main objective here is just to make sure that we're taking care of customers and doing the right things and um, taking information back from what customers experience back into our production facilities and making improvements as needed and keeping people happy. So, and I lead the engineering teams responsible for product development of uh, all the OE product across North America. Yep, and you don't just lead the team, but you are an engineer yourself, correct? Correct. All right. So, again, I do appreciate you taking the time because this is something important to talk about. Whenever you buy an RV, your RV is going to sit on a frame, and very likely it's going to sit on a Lippert frame. So, understanding what that consists of, 
what the thought process is behind its design development and engineering I think is really important. And to a lot of folks who watch YouTube or other social media, they're always curious about exactly how these things are designed, what goes into them, and if they're truly engineered or if they're just kind of put together, right? So I think this is an important conversation to have and I wanna kind of kick it off right away with a question that I know people are wanting to know. So starting with the first question, a lot of people want to know what FrameFlex is. When you hear FrameFlex, what does that mean to you? So when we design the chassis, we expect that it's going to flex some. Um, and when you come down to our engineering facility tomorrow, we'll show you how we measure and characterize that. I think what you're referring to when people are talking about FrameFlex is when there's excessive movement of the chassis, and that's happening relative to the superstructure that's built on top of that by the RV manufacturer. And so uh, obviously we want them to work together. And typically when you're referring to frame flex, it's when something appears like it's not working together correctly. Okay, so from what I'm hearing, the structure of the RV is a combined structure between that superstructure, the, what the RV manufacturer builds on top of the frame and the frame itself that you build, correct? Correct. All right, and when they build the structure on top of the frame, are there guidelines on, how that structure is supposed to be built because what you're telling me is the two have to marry together and both of them together equal the strength that you're looking for in an rv so we don't dictate to our rv manufacturer partners how to build the structure on top of it there are industry accepted practices and we have rv chassis design guidelines that we've developed over the past 10 years that work with those industry accepted practices Okay, so let's just say an RV manufacturer decides to come up with a new floor plan. Okay. And they work with you, I'm assuming, on, or your team, on what that chassis is going to look like, what the frame is going to look like, the specifications behind it. Do these manufacturers, these RV manufacturers, typically have their own engineer that they bring in, or do they just send you a design and say, build a frame for me? So it really depends on who the RV manufacturer is. They all have engineering teams. Uh, but some of them will send us a print and say, make it exactly like this, this is what I want. Um, maybe up to and including solid CAD models, uh, um, complete with material thicknesses. There's others that will just give us a floor plan and really lean on us to provide most of the chassis engineering legwork. Essentially the frame is a part or a component that you build to a manufacturer's specifications and then you send it to them as just one component of the RV assembly process, right? Correct. The superstructure that they build on top of it is super critical to the uh, to the successful function of the overall RV. Okay, so can you can you expand on that a little bit? What do you mean by super critical to the the function of the so RV? So what I mean by that is the the superstructure, the walls, the roof, the uh, the other pieces of the of the RV house that are built on top of the chassis are a significant portion of the st overall structure of the RV. Like I said, when you get down to the testing facility tomorrow and you see it, you'll, you'll understand a little more about what I'm talking about. But um, So that manufacturing process and the mating of that, that structure to the chassis itself so that they're working together in unison is, is very critical for okay. everything to work correctly. When we talk about the RV manufacturer's role in this, building the box, the house on top of the frame, that is supposed to, I, I suppose, stiffen up the entire structure, right? So the frame won't flex as much. But what, to what degree is that house structure supposed to actually carry that structural rigidity of the entire RV structure when it's combined together? Well, I, I think you bring up a good point about um, people's perception of the chassis rolling in, wheels, tires on, um, we talk about, and as Tim mentioned, the walls, the floor, the roof, the end caps, all working in unison with, with the frame. That, that is all works together and is dependent on the structure, structural integrity and performance of an RV. There's so many variables there that I think what, you, I think what you're trying to ask and, and is how do you quantify or what percentage of that comes from the house and what comes from the frame yeah, exactly is it a 50 yeah. 50 thing and or is it reality know? is that i mean it's different between the various builds by the oems because we don't dictate wall thickness wall height wall size whether they're laminated not laminated there's a lot of things there that come into play um that that we don't really have a way to calculate that i think that's where our chassis guidelines come into play with respect to designing to certain 
um, weights, lengths, I-beam sizes, Right, I mean, Correct. you can chime in Correct. here anytime no, as I'm you're getting into great. your side here, but I think I, I, think I yeah, understand yeah. what you're exactly. asking. Exactly. How does everything marry together yeah, to create the There's a lot the of variables there, and that's what makes that a difficult question to answer. My, my next question is really one understanding, and this was actually a question from a viewer asking, if a floor plan change is made after an RV manufacturer receives the frame, do they often notify you of that to say we might need extra reinforcement here we might need extra structure here to support this change that we've made or sometimes do they just build on top of the frame they have sometimes they do and sometimes they don't it really just depends okay so and that could lead to a lot of conclusions for some people saying well should there always be that conversation should they tell you but you don't have insight into the rv manufacturer and what they're doing and if they don't share that information with you then of course i'm assuming you presume that the original specs they sent you are what they're going to be building on top of the frame yeah and they i mean they all do things a little bit differently mm -hmm. and you know there are certain models that are alike that they may order for a future floor plan that is the same as what they're utilizing and presumably you have some of the same variables there so um but there's yeah, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, but it, again, there's varying degrees of mm -hmm. how manufacturers operate inside. They don't all use the same protocol. So I'm going to ask you the next question, which is definitely a harder question to possibly answer, and this is one that was also submitted by a subscriber, and they said, why do you believe these frame issues are occurring? Well, I think the critical thing, again, to talk about is that just the integrity all working together in unison, and typically when you see excessive movement like that, something's come detached. So there's a number of different things that could cause that, whether it's um, you know, something that has come unattached in a particular area, that, that's where when you see that perhaps the walls are not moving when the pin box moves um, and the upper deck is moving, not at the same rate as the walls, that's when you know something's come unattached. Yeah, I mean, certainly if water gets into the sidewall, it, that will compromise the structure and that, that would create a situation. It's just, it's hard to pinpoint until you're actually, until you actually look at each individual situation and you, and you pull that apart and take a look. I think every issue that's occurred has happened in a slightly different way. Yeah. And it's not universally bundled into saying the one issue that this one person may have is identical to the issue someone else may have. Yeah, and you have to take into consideration some of the other things too, as well as loading, um, how vehicles are used. Sometimes you end up with a situation where um, somebody may have seriously overloaded a unit, they pass it off to somebody else. You may have somebody who goes in and thinks that they've addressed the issue but did not go back and make sure that all of the structural integrity is back intact and then you continue to drive it. So progressive damage can also be an issue there as well. Um, Especially when you buy a unit secondhand, yeah, right? It's not that sure. you shouldn't look at pre-owned units, right. but you just never truly know what the first owner might have subjected a unit to or what could what accidents could have happened. Mm -hmm. um, here's a big one and this is one that's important to me and this is one that my viewers also asked about. Can an aftermarket pin box cause frame damage and if so how absolutely you've done such a great job answering the engineering <laughs> questions i'm going to take this one if that's okay <laughs> please do so the the pin box obviously is the is what we call or, or some people call a kingpin um, and and when we design we have the whole structure is designed for a certain size uh, kingpin and so uh, a few years ago we released the space saver upper deck and we intentionally adjusted the kingpin so that the dimension from the chassis to the kingpin was the same as what it was on some of the old designs. And so because of that, if you put a longer pin box in where the shorter one is, it's the same thing as if you're changing your tire and you need a longer lever. When you get that longer lever, you're creating more stress. And so if you take out a pin box that's a certain length and you put in a longer pin box, then you definitely are creating more stress into the chassis. And the thing to remember about stress in steel is the, the, the fatigue life of it is logarithmic. And so a small increase in stress causes a large shortening of the lifespan. And so that's where it's really important that, you know, if you're gonna, gonna go for some sort of an aftermarket pin box or you're gonna change it, you understand exactly what you're doing and you don't increase the leverage going into the chassis. Okay, and I know that there are a lot of aftermarket pin boxes that you all support. Some that you sell, some that your competitors sell, some that other brands sell. I mean, I know that 
of those, you have a process by which you you test them. You wanna say, is this gonna damage our frame? Is it not gonna damage your frame? And I only know this from the fact that I have a Reese Goose box and it's an approved pin box replacement, even though it's not a Lippert manufactured component. I know other brands such as Moride also make approved products, but there are some brands that make products that do fit the RV, but you don't approve them. Why typically wouldn't you approve them? Is it because of that lever arm? Is it because of testing that you've performed to show that it potentially or will cause damage to your structure? So it's a combination of those things. So for example, you, you mentioned Moride and uh, when we created the Space Saver Upper Deck, we actually worked with them to create a pin box that was that same shorter length, so they wouldn't be inducing that extra leverage in there. Uh, some of the other boxes that, we're, that we've mentioned are not approved are longer, and so uh, three inches on a 14 inch extension is a big deal. It's close to 20%. Okay, and I imagine also when people add that long extension to convert their kingpin to a gooseneck connection, you're also increasing that lever arm in a different manner. Um, but are those also not recommended as well in your frames? Any attachment that would bolt onto the kingpin is, um, yeah, no, please don't do that. The pin boxes were not designed for that. Okay. So the next question, again, this is also from a viewer. When you see frame related issues, what do you do? When a customer calls in to report a frame related issue, um, when they email your support to report a frame related issue, they go to your Facebook you know, page and they report that they're having some type of an issue and they believe it's with their frame, what's your typical go forward strategy? Well, I mean, it kind of depends on what it is, but um, generally if it's something that a dealer can take care of, we, we send them to the dealership, but we do have a team of field service people. Um, and when our field service team is dispatched, it's generally something that uh, we'd like to take a look at personally or that, you know, the people can't get to a dealership or there's, there's some extraordinary situation there that they need our help. Um, and so in those cases, if it's something that we find that we did, obviously we take care of that, make sure that if there's an opportunity to make a correction or continuous improvement, we, we evaluate that and make the appropriate changes. Um, similarly to if it's something that we find that one of our RV manufacturer partners did, that we feel like there was a gap in their process, we'll let them know and so that they can make, take corrective action there as well. That's, that's an important part of our relationship with our customers is making sure that we're doing the right thing to make sure that those things don't continue to happen. Okay. So we've, we've gone quite long in this one. I think we've answered some very critical questions. I think understanding how frame flex can occur, that it's actually a natural part of a frame. And once you marry the superstructure to the frame of the RV, that's where you get your true overall rigidity or stiffness of the frame chassis working in unison. Um, how frame flex can become excessive possibly damaged sidewalls, possibly damaged front cap, a roof structure that's not been attached properly, uh, not proper attachment to the frame structure, if I'm saying all this correctly, um, water intrusion, things like that can possibly cause issues as well. And sometimes I think things happen, uh, but you never correlate that thing happening to the damage you now have. Right, so you have a major plumbing leak or water leak with your RV. It floods a section of your RV. It all dries out over a matter of a few days or a few weeks. You don't think anything's wrong, but then a year down the road, you didn't realize that that water caused your floor to rot out or it caused a sidewall to delaminate. And I, I feel that those are sometimes issues that happen and because it happened so long ago and you didn't think about it, it doesn't make you think, well, aha, maybe that's what caused the problem I'm dealing with today. So I think we've addressed a lot of those. Um, we're gonna have a part two and then probably a part three to this because I don't wanna cut your answers short. I want people to have a good understanding when they come away from this. So we're gonna go ahead and end this first video and then we'll start a second video uh, asking some more questions and we're gonna lead off with a pretty dang good question that if you were submitted so you'll have to stay tuned for part two if you want to catch that one anyways guys um i truly appreciate you guys for having me come out here we're gonna ask some really tough questions and these are questions again that you all submitted anyways guys i sure hope you enjoyed this first video please subscribe so you can get notified when part two comes out which will be the next video if you haven't had a chance please take a moment subscribe to the channel give me a thumbs up and we'll talk to you again very soon